Hi, I'm Erin Sousa, the Equinian's Editor-in-Chief. St. Thomas University has found its next president and vice chancellor in Noman Faruqi. He replaces Don Russell, who was set to retire after 11 years as president and vice chancellor on June 30th. Faruqi is the Dean of Business and Social Science at Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. As he prepares to begin his five-year contract, I and the Equinian's news editor, Giuliana Grillo de Lombari, sat down with him for this interview. Dr. Faruqi, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much for your kind introduction, Erin, and thank you, Juliana, uh, for taking the time out to talk to me. Excited to uh, spend some time with both of you. Great to hear. To get the ball rolling, tell us about yourself. As a young man, I said, adventure awaits me. So I went to the U.S., uh, did a Ph.D., and uh, then, uh, you know, for the rest of, you know, rest probably another 10, 15 years, I, you know, didn't stand at university, three, three and a half years, then back in the corporate sector, then another three and a half years back in the university, uh, back in the, uh, in the consulting area, then back in the university. So back and forth, back and forth. And I think so my, my stint at Mount Allison University has been the longest, uh, the 23 years that I've been at Mount Allison has been the, the, the longest uh, I have been, uh, you know, uh, kind of in one in one particular area and field. Um, so that's kind of an abridged version of my of my of my uh, journey thus far. Thank you for that. I would like to ask you, what is your earliest memory, and how did it shape your life? Uh, my earliest memory. Um, I love cars. So my earliest memory is my uncle bought a new car and he bought it home, and I I just you know as a kid I was just so kind of, uh, uh, you know, excited about that. And I still remember that, you know, he took out, you know, the cars usually have like two keys, right? So he, he took out one key, put it in a nice keychain, and it, it gave it to me. And, you know, that was my proudest possession. I would take it everywhere with me and say, this is my car. It was not my car, obviously, but it was just like, you know, for a for a young kid to have that, you know, four or five year old kid to have a key for, a, you know, for, to a real car, is, is a very vivid memory. And uh, I still remember, uh, you know, kind of uh, flaunting it to all my friends and saying that car that you see, you know, this is the key that, you know, that, 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 that's, that's for that, that's used for that car. So, uh, and I think so the, the, uh, you know, the second part of your question was, um, you know, what impact it, you know, kind of uh, had on me. Well, a lifelong passion, love for cars, I guess. <laughs> right. Tell me a little bit about your childhood and how it was growing up. Uh, childhood was uh, really a lot of fun. We were four siblings. I was number two in the family. So, uh, you know, uh, my elder brother got all the attention. Uh, my younger sister got more attention. My youngest brother was the youngest one of the lot. So he got, you know, even more attention. So I was the one who was kind of left out kind of a thing. Um, but I had a great childhood. Um, you know, I, I used to really enjoy um, making stuff on my own. I, I would, I, I just, you know, I, I like to kind of uh, make model airplanes. I could make anything out of anything, you know. Um, I love to kind of, you know, get different boxes and pieces of carton and God knows what else. And, and, and just, you know, kind of really excited about, you know, making all of these projects. Uh, created cities. Uh, I had a lot of dinky toys. I don't know if you if you know what dinky they are, the small like scale model cars kind of a thing. So uh, that was the other thing. And uh, and the 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 other thing was that I I just uh, kind of you know enjoyed um, uh, you know playing with my siblings. We invented all kinds of games as kids. You know, just you know impromptu games we would invent and we would do stuff like that. So. Yeah, really, really very fond memories and, um, and, and a great, uh, you know, happy childhood, you know. Absolutely. You describe yourself as an accidental academic. Tell me about the path that led you to academia. So, like I said, you know, I, I was on the verge of joining a major international bank after completing my uh, MBA. I had done my internship at the bank. Uh, so, you know, uh, at the end uh, of my two-year MBA program, they offered me a, a, a very good job. And I was almost uh, kind of, you know, set to join that. And around that time, I was informed that I had won a scholarship uh, to go to the U.S. and uh, and, uh, and, 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 and and do a PhD. And uh, as a young man, you know, adventurous kind of spirit, I said, you know, banking can wait, you know, I'd love to go and kind of see, you know, what this is all, this is all about. 
And uh, I think so it was, uh, obviously I learned some things out of my PhD program, academically speaking, but I think so it was more of a discovery of myself and uh, what I could do. And, uh, you know, kind of, um, I remember the conversation we used to have with my PhD advisor, a couple of us, you know, you know, we would go and ask him like, you know, so how long before we complete our thesis? Like, you know, you kind of always ask us to do this analysis and do that thing and read this article and do that. And after, you know, several of these meetings, you know, over a period of time, he kind of sat us down and said, uh, you guys think you're pretty smart? You're doing a PhD? You guys think you're pretty smart? I'll tell you what, this is not a test of your intelligence. This is a test of your endurance, if you're going to last that long or not. So, you know, it was an important lesson that, you know, obviously, uh, you know, you need to be, uh, you need to work hard, but also uh, you need to be patient, you know, for the good things to come in life. So that led me to academia. And once I started teaching, you know, it was just addictive. You know, even when I was working in the corporate sector or for the World Bank or the Privatization Commission, I always uh, I always had a course that I would teach in the university. So it was just one of those things that, you know, is addictive. You just have to have that. And the energy and the excitement that, uh, you know, students bring to the classroom and and, and and the joy it brings you as a professor, you know, um, it's as if, you know, all the accomplishments of your students, once they graduate, or even before that, whatever they do, you feel a, a kind of, you know, you feel happy as if you're a part of that success that you're also sharing in that, in that journey that they have. So it's, uh, it's just a, the most gratifying of uh, experiences and, and, and going back in time, if I had an opportunity of, uh, you know, doing it all over again, I think so I would choose academia. This has been just an absolutely wonderful journey thus far um, and, and a really enriching and a fulfill, fulfilling journey. Absolutely. Um, you've been in many countries and I was wondering what brought you to Canada and when did you end up here? Yeah, so like I lived in, I'm from Pakistan originally, so I lived in Pakistan and then I went to the US uh, for a couple of years and uh, came back and then moved to the Middle East. Uh, uh, and then um, a, f a couple of my friends and and, uh, and family had moved to Canada. A lot of my, a lot of my family and friends are in the US and, uh, you know, they'd been asking me to kind of, you know, explore the US and kind of, you know, come to the US and and, and as I was exploring that, you know, uh, Canada seemed like an interesting place. A couple of my friends had gone there and, um, and you know, I, I became, you know, I, I've always kind of taken the path, path less, uh, less traveled, if you will. And uh, so I said, you know what, Canada seems like an interesting country. I haven't been to, I, I lived in the U.S. for many, many years, but never went to Canada, never visited Canada. So um and i looked at you know uh, what people were doing and and uh, you know what was the general kind of uh, uh you know economic situation and what have you in uh, in canada and i decided to uh, try my luck and see uh, you know if there were any uh, opportunities in canada for me and that's when i got got a call from mount allison university they were looking for somebody to come in and fill in a, a sabbatical spot uh, for a year and uh, I said there we go that's my opportunity I'm going to go and check it out it's only a year's worth of contract if I don't like it you know I'll come back I'll go to the US uh, a couple of other offers on the table so I could do that so uh, you know as a young person you you know you kind of like that excitement of exploring and going to new places and and, and seeing what what things are like so that brought me to Canada and uh, initially I landed in Toronto and uh, um, when I came to New Brunswick, everybody in Toronto said, well, there's nothing over there. Don't go there. Like, you know, stay back in Ontario or go to BC and so on and so forth. And the more they kind of discouraged me from coming to New Brunswick and take up the opportunity, the more, um, you know, a firm I became that I, I got to go and I got to check this place out. They have a great university over there. Like there has to be something like it can't be, you know, what you're describing. And, uh, uh, and fast forward 23 years, never look back. Glad to hear that. Um, what do you do outside of work? Uh, what are your hobbies? Um, hobbies, uh, kind of, you know, I like, uh, I like hiking, uh, I like biking. Uh, I kind of like tooling around the house. I, I, I want an excuse to buy a tool. 
So my wife is always saying, why did you need this tool? Well, I got to do this special thing and I need the special tool for that. So so I, I just need an excuse to buy a tool, you know, or something like that. So I, I like working with my hands. I, uh, you know, uh, I'm not like really good at, 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 you know, making stuff, but, you know, I'm pretty good. You know, I, I, I can, I can, I, I can fix things. I can, I can take care of things on, on my own. So uh, those are the things that I do. And, and also spending time, you know, uh, with family, we are, we are empty nesters now, both my kids are, uh, you know, kind of out of the house. So, uh, you know, the time that we had spent with them was really, uh, you know, really great. And uh, we had an opportunity of getting together uh, and we'll get an opportunity of getting together before I fly back to Canada also. So so it's going to be great to touch base with them and spend some quality time. So this next question that's, th- this is a question from what I understand has actually been quite common to ask um, past presidents and vice chancellors at Stu. Are you a fan of hockey? Uh, well, I grew up in Pakistan and we, fa- we play a game which is field hockey. It's not ice hockey. So, you know, it's kind of a slightly different kind of a game. But uh, and, 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 you know, we, 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 we are very passionate about another game called cricket. Uh, you know, if you're familiar with uh, with that game, so cricket and hockey are the games that I grew up, uh, you know, watching. Um, uh, and my father was a great hockey player. He was on the university team and the and and, and the provincial team as well. Uh, so those are the two games that I that, that I've grown up, you know. Uh, but hockey is something my 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 son kind of started playing hockey, so that developed my interest in. You know, waking up at six, six o'clock in the morning, getting getting some Tim Hortons and going to the ice skating rink. So there's this whole culture around that. So you know that was that was also interesting. And uh, yeah, so I got to I got to be careful in in choosing my teams uh, because I know the the Canadians are very very we are very passionate about you know our our, our hockey teams. So I, I won't say any anything about which team is my favorite. <laughs> I, I'll wait to come on campus and kind of figure out you know. <laughs> What is politically correct, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, do you plan on moving to Fredericton once you assume the role of president? Absolutely. Looking forward to that. My wife is already on, on you know, she's on the phone, on the email, uh, you know, talking to realtors and checking out. She's, she's got a gazillion homes that she's showing me every single day. Like, what about this? What about this? So she's in charge of that. So she's taking care of that. And uh, hopefully, you know, we'll find some place uh, uh, that kind of fits our needs and uh, and uh, and the plan is that yeah we are looking forward to moving and uh, being a part of the community over there. Right, as I said, you have been in many countries before, but how did you decide Canada was the place you would like to pursue a career in? Like I said, you know, I had a couple of friends who had moved to Canada and some family members who had moved to Canada, and uh, I have a lot of family in the U.S. and in Europe and. Uh, um having lived in america i was more comfortable in coming to north america than going to europe you know to explore opportunities and uh, uh you know canada seemed like a you know an interesting destination a, a different country a different place i had never been there before uh, so it seemed like you know hey let's go to canada and see you know what's happening there and uh, you know it's just been a wonderful experience you know absolutely you're the first person of color to be the future president of STU. What does this mean for you and for students of color? Um, yeah, I think so. Being a part of a visible minority, you know, um, uh, it's an important thing that we are kind of moving the agenda forward across Canada. I think so more needs to be done. Uh, and uh, and I'm happy that, you know, uh, uh, that that uh, that you know it's it's uh, on the top of the agenda of uh, of the country of institutions of, of of universities, and I'd love to kind of play my role in order to kind of uh, you know push the file forward you know and uh, and and make it more equitable and uh, and uh, and and more kind of you know even playing playing field for everyone you know. Right, um, if you had a chance to jump in a time machine. Is there anything you'd like to change or do differently? No, like I said, you know, I think so. This has been the most fulfilling uh, kind of, uh, you know, career I could have thought of. So if you're talking about career use, career wise, you know, I, I, I would probably go back if I could go back in time. Like I said, you know, I'd probably decide on academia. Uh, that's what I'd like to do. Finally, what keeps you going? I think so. This is uh, again, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of you know going back to that point again. 
but because I feel so strongly about it, um, the fact that, uh, you know, I love what I do and, and people are willing to pay me money to do that, you know. So I wake up every morning with a smile on my face because I'm excited to, you know, go and do stuff and, and meet people and, 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 uh, and every job has its own challenges. You know, there's no job in the world that does not have challenges. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's all, it's all about kind of looking at the challenge and trying to find out, you know, what is the solution to that? And, you know, no, no one person knows all the answers. The key is to know who to go and talk to, who are the people who are best equipped to answer a question or give you advice uh, and are the subject specialists. Um, so I think so. it's really important to have a good team of people around you, to really have strong people around you, to have people who can voice their opinions and share their, uh, you know, uh, share their uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, share pros and cons about different decisions that are going to be made. Um, so I think so. It's it's uh, it's 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 uh, it's something that that uh, that really uh, drives me is to take on uh, a problem and and try to solve it. You know how how can we solve it? You know how can we creatively come up with a solution that tries to uh, solve the problem and then some. For Thank sure. You for that. So we're now going to move on to um, to more of the, I, I guess you could say, um, direct questions related to the university. So I, I guess just to start off, why did you apply for this position at St. Thomas? So I've been at Mount Allison for 23 years. I joined the university as a as a as a contract employee. Uh, got into a tenure track position. Uh, you know, became an associate professor, a full professor. I've been the head of the uh, commerce department uh, for two terms, and, and and then became the dean of business and social sciences. So one of the uh, reasons why I decided to kind of look into the administrative side of university is because as a young university professor, you know, we would, you know, sitting, you know, standing by the water cooler or in the coffee room, we would talk about, you know, this is such a simple fix. Why doesn't the dean do this? You know, why doesn't the head of the department do this? You know, why doesn't the provost do this? You know, this is just a simple thing. Why, you know, why can't they do that? And that, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, made me very curious as to like, can these people make those you know decisions can why why aren't they doing these things you know and uh, as head of the department you know so i i kind of you know decided to put my name in the hat for the for the head of the department and i i i got appointed as the head and quickly i found two things you know one was that there were certainly things that were within my uh, within my purview that i could change right and those are the things that I could really make an impact, an immediate impact. Uh, so that was one. The second uh, thing I realized was that given the vantage position of, uh, of being the head of the department, you have a better idea of some of the, uh, uh, you know, some of the connectedness of the different uh, of different things to uh, a decision that you want to make. So that vantage point allowed me to uh, really appreciate, uh, you know, why certain decisions were being made. Uh, but in my, uh, you know, in my kind of administrative role, I've always made it a point to uh, communicate directly, uh, to uh, really lay all the cards on the table and say, look, hey, you know, these are the facts. This is what we are trying to do. This is what we need to accomplish. This is this. These are the parameters within which we have to operate. Um, uh, this is the wish list that we all have. But this is what we can do. Uh, and uh, so let's get together and try to make a decision which is going to be the most pragmatic decision given the state of affairs we are in right now and then move ahead and then we'll make another decision. Uh, in management, they say there is no best decision because decision making always requires input and data and data is continuous. It keeps on coming. So uh, in management, you, 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 you cannot make a best decision. You can make a timely decision. You make a decision based on the facts that you have on hand, the data that you have on hand, you make a decision. And you know, further down the road, you have more data, then you make another decision. And further down the road, you have more data, you make another decision. But you know, uh, paralysis of analysis, I think so, is one of the worst things that can hit institutions. Uh, you want to make a decision. Obviously, you don't want to make rash decisions, but you want to make a decision which is timely, which is pragmatic, which is keeping uh, you know your eyes open and really uh, you know focusing on what is it that we can do right now. 
like you know i i, I wish i had a million dollars i could do this and that i could buy a yacht i could do that but i don't have a million dollars i've got like $20,000 in my pockets what is it that i can do in $20,000 to really make an impact right or if i don't have more than $20,000 where do i go and find that money you know can i go to the government can i you know uh, you know uh, uh, you know, uh, buy a lottery ticket. What, what is it that I could do in order to in order to kind of you know make that change? And so uh, you mentioned the decision making. I'm wondering what was the decision making process to apply to be president and vice chancellor at oh, St. Yeah. Thomas? Yeah, sorry, going back. I, I think so. I lost uh, track of your original question. So, um, so having done all of those things, I realized that. Uh, you know, uh, there are things that 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 I was able to accomplish again, working with an, with a fantastic team of uh, faculty, administrators, and, and and students at Mount Allison. Um, and I think so. I've learned a lot. I think so. I've 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 gained a lot of experience, and that experience uh, has allowed me, uh, hopefully, you know, to to go on to the next uh, to the next uh, level of my career and and make an impact at a bigger scale. Uh, so it's essentially, you know, painting on a bigger canvas, if you will, uh, you know, moving away from my canvas uh, 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 in a deaconal position uh, to the position of a president, a bigger landscape, a bigger uh, kind of a canvas to uh, really put all the experience and all the work that I've done, done over the years to, uh, to, good, good, to good use and practice. So when the opportunity at St. Thomas University came up, uh, it was an ideal fit because uh, it fit the bill of, uh, you know, a small university, a connected university, a community that is really very passionate about what they do. Uh, and at the same time, it was in the Maritimes. It was in New Brunswick. You know, um, uh, I've been here 23 years. I There were there been opportunities elsewhere, but, you know, I, I didn't want to move. Um, but this was an opportunity that was, you know, too good to turn down. For sure. And you talk about what you learned over your years at Mount Allison. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what makes you qualified to lead a liberal arts university like St. Thomas. I think so. Leadership is not one person who's leading the university. It's a whole team of people that lead the university. You know, uh, leadership is uh, similar to, and I, you know, I use that favorite example, you know, leadership is uh, akin to uh, uh, a music a conductor of a music orchestra uh, the conductor doesn't know all the all the instruments right but he or she knows which particular musician to call upon at which particular point in time of a symphony in order to contribute to that symphony so that ultimately what happens is that you create music you don't create noise so i think so given my experience in the public sector private sector corporate sector uh, you know, I've learned to appreciate, you know, uh, uh, the power of the team, uh, appreciate that, you know, there are people who are much brighter and smarter than I am. And I and I and I benefit tremendously from their advice. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I've realized that, uh, you know, we, we all have to work together, uh, roll up our sleeves and, and do our part in order to move it forward. No one person can move the agenda forward in any organization. Uh, it is essentially uh, a teamwork that does that, and having experienced that in different in different uh, sectors, whether it's uh, academia, whether it's uh, the private sector, the corporate sector, or the um, you know uh, or the uh, or the uh, uh, you know university sector, I, I, this is one common theme that I found that successful organizations uh, have great teams. They have people who are willing to contribute. They are they are leaders who are willing to listen. Uh, who are willing to uh, make uh, pragmatic decisions, uh, and and at the same time, you know, pe uh, leaders who realize their shortcomings and understand that they don't know everything. You know, they 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 need to have a good group of people around them, and hence a strong team is really very important to move the agenda forward. And so you'll begin your role as president and vice chancellor in July. What are the first three things that you will do in that role? Uh, the first, uh, you know, the first order of business is to just go around and meet everyone, you know, just to, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, my, my impression of, of St. Thomas University, despite all the stuff I've read about the university is as an outsider, uh, you know, I've visited campus a couple of times, but again, as an outsider, I've not been a member of the community. Um, I haven't lived in Fredericton, so, 
so I think so the one of the one of the first and the most important tasks is going to be just to get the people, get to know the people and the institution, you know, go around, talk to people, see what, you know, what they what 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 did what drives them, you know, what motivates them, what's happening. Um and uh and 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 take a stock of the situation of where we are in terms of some of the internal workings of the of the of the university, you know, in terms of enrollment, in terms of finances, in terms of plans, in terms of degrees, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, some of the things that are on the cards that the university is planning to kind of you know roll out. Uh, so just to get an understanding of what what's what happened before, what's happening now, what are the plans for the future. Um, so that I'm I'm better equipped to you know to kind of you know decide on 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 kind of, okay so what what are the priority areas that we need to move on? And I want to pick up on something that you said in your response there. Um, you mentioned that there were things that you had read about Stu as an outsider. Tell me a little bit about what you had read about Stu. Again, like it's a it's a very uh, connected university uh, community that's really very passionate about it. Um, you know, students who go to Stu are you know they're, they're a different breed of students. They're not your regular cookie cutter students. Uh, and you know, having uh, having you know lived and breathed uh, the air at Mount Allison University for so long, you know, you develop a knack for kind of picking up the vibes. You know, uh, and that's the kind of vibe I got at at at, at St. Thomas University when I visited. You know, um, a couple of times, and more so when I visited as a candidate. You know, because I got to meet a lot of lot more people, uh, a lot of people during that during that uh, you know day and day and a half uh, visit that 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 I did in December. Um, so, so I think so. The most important thing is uh, passion. You know, if people are passionate. They you know they, 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 about what they do and about the success of an organization. Uh, that's the first ingredient for success. Last year, St. Thomas ran a $500,000 deficit. And the the topic of the university finances has been one that continues to pop up over the last couple of years. I'm wondering what your plans are to address Stu's pocketbook. And this is something uh, the CBC, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jean also asked me this morning. And it's a question that, you know, I need to really get into the nitty gritty. I need to kind of see what's happening, you know, what happened over the last, uh, you know, several years. I understand that the pandemic has had an impact. It has, an, it had, it has had an impact on all universities across the board, right? Um, you know, look at the government funding, you know, it's not been keeping pace with inflation. It's uh, more or less, uh, you know, stable or, or stag stagnant, you know, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, and uh, it's put a lot of uh, a lot of pressure on university budgets. Uh, you obviously have to have resources in order to provide good quality education. You've got the government money coming in, you've got endowments, you've got, you know, return on investments on those endowments, you've got the tuition fee. So you got to figure out, you know, each of those parts of money, how much is each contributing, what are your expenses, you know, where are the expenses uh, the most, you know, what are the things that are being hit by the inflationary pressure the most and uh, take a stock of the situation and then figure out, okay, how do we manage that? You know, what's happening with the enrollments, you know, what is the growth, where is the growth coming from? If, if it's stagnant, then why is it stagnant? So there are lots of different. Uh, it's it's not kind of one fix that will take care of uh, of of you know uh, of of the revenue, uh, you know, kind of uh, or the deficit situation. I think so. There are a number of different things that will uh, need to be taken care of, uh, and I assume that there the people are working diligently on that on, on this problem. It's it's a, it's a big problem across universities. Every university is faced with that problem. So I would like to come in and take uh, and and really understand from the experts who are, who have been dealing with this issue and this problem for uh, you know for some time now to get a to get my head around you know what's going on what happened how is it being taken care of what are some of the strategies uh, that people who are in the know you know they know more than me uh, what are they doing you know uh, and then i have my comments i i I'd certainly share my candid comments with them uh, and based on the information i receive and based on the data that i have in front of me um, I, I, I can certainly, you know, suggest some ideas and solutions, but it has to be based on facts, on the ground realities, what is happening, you know, uh, at, at Stu specifically, you know, 
Uh, so I think we really need to get educated and understand, you know, uh, the the situation, what what happened, what is what is being done about it, and what is the plan. And a top concern for students at St. Thomas is, of course, tuition costs. And over the last couple of years, tuition has gone up quite a bit. And students obviously are feeling concerned about that. So I'm, I'm wondering, what are you going to do as president and vice chancellor to help keep tuition stable? So it goes back to the same uh, question, Erin, that you talked about, that, that you talked about, that I talked about earlier, that, you know, you, you have to kind of find a mechanism or a solution to uh, the, the revenue problem, the revenue source problem. So where is the money going to come from, right? And uh, I think so the the last, uh, you know, place that we should look at for revenue increases the student uh, tuition, you know. Certainly, there are certain increases that are keeping pace with inflation and what have you, the cost of living, you know, that that's kind of, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about extraordinary increases, if you will. Um, so I think so if you have, if you have a solid strategy in place that would allow you to operate your budget uh, at, at, uh, at an even keel or on a surplus, ideally speaking, uh, you will not have to kind of, you know, uh, go into, uh, you know, hiking tuition to the extent uh, that, you know, students feel the pain for that, you know, um, post-secondary education uh, should be accessible, available uh, to everyone. Uh, it shouldn't come at the expense of, you know, mortgaging your future. So over your time at Mount Allison, you did mention that you've learned a lot from those 23 years that you've been there. What is it that you have learned at Mount A that you're going to bring to Stu in this role? I think so. I, uh, I owe a lot to Mount Allison. You know, it's been my it's been my uh, uh, it's been my home for so long, um, and uh, you know the things that are tangible I've learned in terms of skill sets, in terms of you know um, uh, ability to manage different things that that were put in front of me, but also a lot of intangible things. You know. Uh, which you cannot really, uh, you know, kind of uh, measure or or kind of quantify. You know, uh, I think so. I'll 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 be able to bring all of those things, and uh, and certainly I I'm sure there are so many other um, uh, things that I will learn and I will uh, kind of you know appreciate from this two community as well. So uh, you know, I believe strongly believe in synergy. So two plus two is five. So that's what I'm uh, looking forward to. And of course, you mentioned earlier, you mentioned Mount Allison's popularity as a university here in Canada. Um, what is it about Mount A that made it successful and how can that be transferable, I guess, to St. Thomas? Again, goes back to the community, to the people, you know, people make it happen, you know, no, no one person can bring about that change. Uh, it has to be uh, in, um, uh, a kind of a core belief that we can do something, you know, uh, we can achieve, uh, uh, you know, whatever it is that we want to achieve together. And if all the hands are pulling in one direction, you know, they're kind of, you know, uh, pushing or pulling in one direction, you know, that's what makes things happen. And that's the case with Mount A, you know, Mount A, uh, you know, uh, is, a, is a fantastic, you know, university, you know, has been ranked number one for, you know, more than two decades as the top undergrad university in Canada. And it's because of the community, it's because of the, you know, because of the, uh, you know, the faculty, the, the, the people who are managing the university, the staff members who are really dedicated, uh, you know, the quality students that we are able to attract, uh, the town of Sackville itself, you know, the community within that. So all of those go into, you know, that, that secret sauce, if you will, you know, that creates that magic that allows the university to be what it is, you know. Uh, and like I said earlier on, when I visited St. Thomas University, I got similar vibes from the community over here. So uh, I, I strongly feel that, you know, the ingredients are all there. Um, we just need to uh, maybe kind of with the help of everyone, you know, uh, uh, you know, make some changes to the recipe and we are good to go. And so you mentioned that you will be moving to Fredericton once you assume this role. I'm wondering what your plans are to make yourself approachable to students and engage with the campus and, and the greater Fredericton communities. 
Yeah, I think so. First order of the business is going to be to really understand the community. So I'd like to, like I said, you know, meet all and sundry. So I'd like to kind of go around uh, and and meet a lot of people. Um, but I think so. The most important uh, uh, job right now is going to be to really understand the, you know, the inner workings of the university. And for that, I think so. A fair bit of time will have to be spent with the administration, uh, with the faculty. You know, uh, uh, you know, some some student, uh, you know, kind of leadership organizations, just to get a sense of, you know, where we are and and, and what we are doing and and what are the plans. Um, and once that is done, once you know, I I have a fair uh, handle on those things, um, then kind of move forward and uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, working together with the community, develop uh, a strategic plan which is going to take us to the to the next level. Um, that's going to be an important part of the job. It's going to take a fair bit of time to get that done because before that you need to you need to have a lot of preparation before really execute executing or even trying to kind of you know uh, work on 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 a strategic plan. And after that, you know, I intend to hopefully you know uh, be up and about and and uh, and uh, and and try to connect with faculty, try to connect with students. Um, uh, at Mount Allison, we have a university club, a really lovely, you know, uh, uh, place run by uh, by not the uh, food service people, by you know, uh, uh, by uh, by a Mount Allison a faculty member's spouse, and uh, it's housed in the old president's uh, cottage on campus. It's a lovely place, so you know, as part of. Uh, uh, it was a regular feature that, you know, I would take out two faculty members to lunch every week before pandemic and just, you know, just just have a conversation, you know, um, the entrepreneurship class, uh, you know, I used to take out the president and the chairperson, you know, for a meeting every other week kind of a thing, or it, I think so once a month, something like that, just to get a feel of what what's going on. And also, you know, so many student uh, activities and functions and events happening in which you are able to interact with the community and kind of see what's happening, get a vibe, a feel of the vibe, uh, and get a get a sense of, uh, uh, you know, uh, what people are thinking, uh, what 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 they like, what they don't like, and and I and I and I would appreciate, you know, people being candid about uh, candid about things uh, uh, because uh, that's what that's what makes one improve, you know. So the public has been allowed to attend Stu Senate. University politics is a huge is a huge area of interest at St. Thomas. But in 2021, a decision was made for the president's report of University Senate to go in camera. I'm wondering if you will reverse this decision so that university politics can remain as transparent as possible. Uh, Erin, I'm not aware of why it was done or what were the reasons for that. So I'll probably have to look into, you know, why it happened. Uh, it seemed like an extraordinary event. So I would love to kind of get a feel of, you know, you know, hear both sides of the story as to, you know, what happened, why, were the, what, what, what was the, what was the issue or the issues. Uh, and, and, and then even form an opinion as to, you know, what needs to be done. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm not aware of, you know, why it was done, so I can't really comment on that, you know. For sure. Um, there are also rumors that have dated back decades expressing worry about even a possible merger between the two campuses, between St. Thomas and between the University of New Brunswick. And even past presidents have openly stated that it's a concern. I'm wondering, is it a concern for you? I don't think so. I think so. St. Thomas University has their own identity, you know. Uh, I think so. It's in, it's it's a fantastic independent uh, entity in itself. It has a proud history. Uh, it has a bright future in front of uh, in front of uh, in front of it. Um, so you know, uh, you know, if you're talking about mergers and acquisitions, you know, we do a lot of that in finance, and then it's pretty cutthroat. Okay, why UNB? Why don't we make just one huge giant university of all the New Brunswick universities and have campuses all over, right? So where do you stop, right? So if you're looking at efficiencies, then there's a lot of different ways that you can do why don't have why don't we have one mega bank rather than have than having cibc and royal bank and you know scotia uh you know uh, uh you know there's a reason why we have these different banking institutions there's a reason why we have these different universities there's a reason why we have 
you know, uh, different entities, uh, you know, uh, to really allow for a better choice, to allow for uh, people to really uh, find their niche, if you will. Uh, and universities are really, uh, you know, very important institutions. You know, young, uh, you know, people spend four years of a very formative time in their life at these institutions. So I think so it's, um, it's them who should decide, you know, if uh, God forbid, you know, if a university is really irrelevant or is not really finding any traction, they won't come to that university. And that itself would be the demise of the university, if you will, right? Uh, but we see there is, you know, we look at Mount Allison, you look at any small liberal arts university, we have students who are coming there who are really passionate about it, who are very proud about their association with these universities. So uh, hence the case for their unique identity and the fact that there is there is there is something there that that that, uh, you know, that needs to be preserved and maintained, you know. Uh, and not sacrifice as, at the altar of, you know, efficiencies, you know, because uh, if you take the argument, then you can take it to any extreme and let's do it with everyone then. Why only St. Thomas University, right? For sure. And you also mentioned, uh, you know, the unique identity that St. Thomas has. And one of those unique identities is that it offers a liberal arts education. How valuable is a liberal arts education in 2023? I think so. The liberal arts education is relevant ir ir irrespective of, you know, whether it's 2023 or 2021 or 2026, you know, because, uh, we are, you know, the jobs of tomorrow, we don't know what those jobs of tomorrow are or what the jobs of the next five years or 10 years or 15 years are. We, we don't know those jobs, but we know for a fact that there will be a demand for young people who are passionate about what they do. They're willing to work hard. They're willing to think outside the box. They're creative. They're flexible. They have good communication skills. They can think on their feet. Uh, they're articulate. Uh, they're smart. They they have they wear an interdisciplinary lens. They don't look at things you know from a unidimensional point of view. They know things are connected. They know that the world is connected. You can't press one button and not expect a reaction in another place. Um, so I think so there will always be a need for those kinds of people irrespective of what the job market of tomorrow is. So we cannot focus on the flavor of the month kind of a thing and then just, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of go with that. Uh, I think so liberal arts universities have always tacked away, if I can use a sailing term, you know, they've tacked away uh, and tacking away, you know, you find your own wind, you find you catch your own wind. And and you know you 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 got you you got you got destinations to go to, for sure. And based on based on what St. Thomas currently has now in terms of programming, in terms of the areas in which a, a student can major, is there anything that you would want to add to that? Uh, I guess to that framework of what is available for students to study here. Uh, again, uh, Aaron, like, you know, I, I, I need to really educate myself, understand, you know, why, you know, a certain program, you know, uh, you know, what is the current offering, you know, what's the, you know, what's the rationale for that, you know, uh, why is the program successful? Why is a, a program kind of, you know, uh, being introduced, and what have you so. So I think so before kind of, you know, really educating myself and understanding the, uh, the inner workings. Uh, I I'd probably should shy away from making any comments, you know, uh, I certainly have ideas, uh, but I'd love to hear more from people who, you know, who are at St. Thomas University and, and, and hear what their, what their ideas are, right? Um, as a consultant, one of the things I learned was that the best ideas come from the people within the organization. We are hired as consultants to go into organizations and, you know, kind of come up with a plan of what needs to be done and what needs to be addressed. But 90% of the times, the problem is known to the people, the solution is known to the people. Uh, the consultant's job is to kind of, you know, connect the dots and kind of say, look, here, you know, this is what needs to be done. So I'd love to hear from the people, uh, you know, uh, who, who are on board right now and, and get a sense from them before I can, you know, offer uh, my uh, my suggestions or my, my ideas, you know. And we only have a couple more seconds. So I just want to ask finally, what is overall, what is the overall future of St. Thomas University in your perspective? I think so. It's a bright future. I think so. There's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of stuff that, uh, that you know, uh, that has happened in the past that, uh, you know, St. Thomas University is proud of, uh, should be proud of. 
Uh, I think so uh, from my understanding uh, of the people that I met, they're all very passionate uh, about, you know, where they are, you know, w- you know, what they're doing and the contribution that they're making uh, to, you know, to New Brunswick, to, to Canada, to, to the, to the world, you know, um, so I think so that passion is really uh, what is going to drive us forward, you know, and, and the, and the team spirit, uh, to kind of all, uh, you know, uh, you know, pull towards a common goal. I think so. It, 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 that's that's what's that's what's going to really, really drive us forward. And I think so. There's a bright future, and and a lot of good things have happened, and a lot more good things are going to happen in the future. Well, Dr. Fruki, that's all the questions that we had. No, certainly uh, it was a pleasure to connect with you, and, and thank you, Juliana and Erin, for uh, taking the time out and. Uh, uh, I'm glad that I was wearing a jacket. I didn't know it was going to be recorded, you know, otherwise I would have put up with a shirt or something like that. So uh, at least I was presentable enough. Uh, thank you for warning me about the Zoom link, you know, no worries at all. And I'm really uh, looking forward to meeting you in person, you know, uh, when, I, when I arrive on campus uh, somewhere in June kind of a thing. Uh, so till then, uh, stay safe, uh, you know, and uh, enjoy the snow and uh, see you in a bit.